Welcome everyone to today's episode of the How Did They Do It Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Eileen Prack. And today we have two guests for you. One is Mark Schuler, and the other is Josh Welch. And a little bit about Mark. He is a licensed architect in the states of Washington and Texas with more than 35 years of professional experience as an architect, engineer, business owner, and real estate investor. And as the principal of Schuler Architecture, he has amassed a massive portfolio of over 500 projects in more than 15 states. And Josh is the CEO and founder of Three Pillars Capital Group, a Houston-based real estate private equity firm and Greenline Apartment Management. TPCG purchases and renovates value-add multifamily investment properties targeting a workforce demographic. And he also has an engineering background and has worked in fields from defense contracting and financial modeling to data mining. So welcome to the show, Mark and Josh. How are the two of you doing today? Good. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks for having us. Thank you guys for both uh, joining me today on today's episode. Um, so I'd really love to hear a little bit more about um, each of your backgrounds and how you guys got started in real estate. Um, and then maybe you can talk about how you guys came together and formed a, a partnership. Um, so I guess, Mark, if you'd like to start and then Josh, you can um, follow after. Sure. Um, I have been uh, practicing architect for uh, about 35 years and Certainly along the way, I worked with a lot of developers. Um, I've designed a lot of large multifamily projects. Um, and about 10 years ago, or maybe even longer, um, just got really curious about the deal-making side of the business. I was always a hired gun to kind of do the design, engineering, and entitlement side of things. But you know, I, I figured out pretty early in my career that there was a lot of deal making that went on prior to my engagement. And, and I'm from a family of entrepreneurs and we're it just so happens we're all in real estate one way or another. So uh, I got really curious about that side of the business. So about, uh, oh man, it must be uh, almost 20 years ago, I went to the University of Washington and got an advanced degree in commercial real estate development. Took me a while, but I just started doing deals on my own. And so I amassed a, a small portfolio here in the Puget Sound and then started looking in Texas and uh, met Josh in one of those reconnaissance trips. And we've been doing deals ever since. So yeah. that's my background. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so my background is I, you know, I, I'm an engineer by trade. So I, uh, you know, was doing engineering for, um, large defense contractor for, for many years, and then segued into um, basically quantitative uh, analysis, financial modeling for um, various hedge funds and institutional banks. So that's kind of how I got into the finance side of things. Uh, but all along the way, I was building a portfolio of single family homes um, because I just kind of realized that there's you know, a lot of people that do well in this country that have a lot of wealth and I've discovered that most of them do it through real estate. And, um, you know, I kind of have a knack for it. I, I understand value. I can see, uh, I can understand markets and sub markets and kind of see where there's opportunity to create value, um, you know, sell for a profit, refinance, pull your cash out, the whole nine yards. But while I was doing the single family realm, it was just, it was very slow. It's a very slow climb to the top when you're doing single family because every transaction, is almost as complicated as a multifamily transaction is, except you have to do it a hundred times, you know, scale on a hundred times X versus you can buy one apartment building that's a hundred units and basically accomplish the same thing. You just need a little bit more equity. So I kind of, when the light bulb went off, I basically decided that, hey, multifamily is the, the branch of real estate that I want to segue into. Um, so I started liquidating the single families that I had and started very organically building, um, you know, portfolio of multifamily complexes started out with a 14 unit here in Houston and kept growing and scaling and growing our uh, investor network along the way. Um, and as Mark mentioned, we met at one of those, those trips when Mark was in our network and we reached out to him to be an investor and lo and behold, we wound up being better <laughs> coach EPs than yeah. just having Mark as an investor, you know, so it worked out really well. And uh, Mark's been, uh, been with us on geez, six or seven deals so far. They've all been working out great. Um, you know, as as of today, we're right around 2,000 units. Um, portfolio valuation is about 250 million in assets and uh, growing and scaling leaps and bounds. 
Oh, awesome. So, I, I mean, it sounds like you guys are, are doing really great things where you guys are at. Um, which kind of, which markets do you typically focus on? Is it just mostly in the Texas or do you also look outside as well? Well, I used to do uh, deals in the Puget Sound, but, uh, you know, um, Seattle and the uh, immediate area is sort of becoming the Silicon Valley of uh, the Northwest. Um, housing prices in uh, San Francisco and the Bay Area are just really off the chart. And a lot of companies have been relocating up here. Plus, there's a couple of companies here, you maybe have heard of them, you know, kind of the elder statesman being Microsoft and then the new kid on the block is this little company called Amazon. Um, you know, there's a lot of tech talent here in the Puget Sound, um, high wage jobs and uh, have driven, you know, home prices and rental rates uh, astronomically north. I just found I couldn't find any more deals here. At least I couldn't find deals that worked for me. So I started looking down in the Houston area after a long analysis of what markets I wanted to be in. I just love Houston from an investing point of view. I also like it from a cultural point of view. It's, you know, the most diverse city in America, which I thrive in an environment like that because I'm from Detroit. And, you know, I just, I just like seeing, being outside of my box and my bubble. So, um, that's the place I'm most interested in, but I look at a lot of different deals in a lot of different markets, but I keep coming back to Houston. And so, so far you guys have done, um, you know, quite a number of units between the two of you. And, you know, what is it about the, your company that kind of sets you apart, do you think, um, that has enabled you to scale to where you have been to today? Yeah. Um, you know, the business is very noisy. There's a lot of players in this space. Anybody that tells you multifamily is easy to get into and, you know, build your dream team and that's all it is. They're, they're, they're misinforming you. It's a lot more than that. Um, it's extremely cutthroat. It can be very competitive. You can lose a deal um, if you're not too aggressive with your price or your terms. I mean, we've, we've seen it. We've seen all of it. Um, what sets us apart is the fact that, you know, we focus primarily on class B and C housing. And basically it's workforce housing, right? We're talking about folks that make, uh, you know, median income of around, you know, 30 to maybe 50,000. Um, can't really afford, you know, the brand new luxury type class A buildings where rent might be 1500 to $2,000 a month for one bedroom, depending on the part of the country that you're in. And so the option for these folks, you know, and they, especially with, home affordability becoming further and further out of reach. Um, you know, the, the option is really, you know, class B and C apartment. And unfortunately, if you look at most of the class B and C's in this country, they're pretty crappy. It's part of my, part of my crude language, but I mean, they're not great, right? They're, you know, usually outdated. Um, they're in desperate need of an update just to even keep with modern looks. And so our edge is that we have our management and construction company all in one, it's all under one umbrella. Um, and so we're able to really control costs and quality. And we're also able to, because we keep the costs down by doing it in house, uh, we're able to do like luxury looking finishes in our you know, workforce housing units. And they're finishes that again, this, this particular demographic wouldn't normally have access to, you know, granite countertops, nice new flooring, luxury designer lighting, you know, the whole nine yards, they really feel like they're living in like a luxury condo. And we have, uh, are able to do this work not only on the, uh, on the cheap, but also because we're doing it for so, you know, inexpensively, we don't have to charge uh, sky, hawk at, uh, sky high rents to get our cost basis and our ROI on that, on that money that was spent. So we're able to still provide quality units at prices that, uh, you know, these people can afford. And a lot of operators cannot do that. A lot of people, going back to what I said about building their dream team, you know, if you build your dream team with just a, a regular construction company, um, they're going to charge you an arm and leg for the work that we do. Um, and so that's why a lot of people just don't do that kind of work in class B and C. So that's that's really our edge. And if I could follow up on that, Ellie, um, we have a new deal that we're, we just sent out very recently, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And we compared what our cost basis was for the renovation against third party uh, contractors. And we are about 52% of what those contractors were charging us. So 
the real advantage to our company is that all gets driven to the bottom line, that, that delta, that 48% delta gets driven right to the bottom line and we're paying five to 6% on the IR more than our competition. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, uh, we have this model we've been building for a number of years now that uh, is uh, because of the vertical integration just provides us with a re really low cost basis on our assets. Um, for people just thinking that they can get into the business and execute on this, I, you know, I can assure you as a practicing architect who's built many structures, it takes years to learn how to effectively manage a project like this. And um, you have to have some construction um, chops too. So it's, it's a lot more complicated than it sounds and the gurus that are out there, you know, selling their weekend workshops and how you can, you know, break into multifamily. It's just not true. I mean, you can do maybe a little fourplex or something like that, but on the size deals that we're doing, you, it, it takes years of experience. Yeah. Especially when you're able to impact the bottom line that significantly, you know, it goes straight back to the investors and you're able to, like you mentioned, you're able to offer a higher uh, return to um, investors because you guys are already, because you guys are already so vertically integrated. Right. Yeah. So as you guys were starting out with this company, um, did you see that as the business model that you wanted to get into um, by creating a vertical integrated company, or was that something that kind of developed over time? It was kind of an organic realization. So we started out thinking that, yeah, we'll hire a third party manager. We'll hire, you know, this constructor coming to do the work. And what we discovered was that not only was the quality of the work and the time it took to get it done way worse, um, but we were barely making any money. I mean, there was the cash flow was, you had to spend so much um, extra renovation dollars to get the work done that we're like, wait a minute, we're, I'm going to be projecting a 10 IR deal with a 2% cash flow. If I do it this way, there's got to be a better way. And then we started studying some of the greats, um, you know, that have done very well in multifamily. And the key thing that linked them all was the fact that they have, um, if not <clears throat> one of the processes in house, all of them in house. So whether that's their own um, asset management division where they're finding market uh, deals off market or they have the construction piece in house, they had one of those things that they were doing themselves. They were not relying on some third source to do that thing for them. Because every time you have a third party, anything, there's a middleman involved and that means you're going to be paid more for that same thing. So if you can figure out how to do something in house, whether it's construction or management or what have you, you're going to be better off for it and you're making, you're going to have a better return on your, on your investment. And so in terms of managing all the different arms and um, legs inside within the company, you know, how have you, how have you been able to make sure that everything ticks and ties and talks to each other efficiently? That's uh, an ongoing uh, conversation. You know, um, you're always working on that. And it's just like any other business. I mean, there's just always a bunch of moving parts and you know, the, it's what's going on behind the scenes that investors don't see or the contractors don't see or your viewers don't see. I can assure you, there's just a lot of conversations. Josh and I talk, you know, two, three times a day. And mm -hmm. um, it's just a lot of management, making sure that uh, your communication, more than anything else, that you're communicating with people and maintaining transparency and just staying out in front of it is really the key. And, uh, you know, you can't react in this business. You have to be very proactive. And if uh, you are um, lacking the, you know, the experience or the knowledge to be able to understand how the business is supposed to be running, you're, you're just always going to be reacting. And that's just, I, you're not going to be able to produce the returns for your investors uh, coming from a place like that. So as you guys are implementing your uh, value add strategy upon um, acquisition of the properties, you know, how much time do you think that you have saved in terms of like the, um, the, um, the construction costs and timings and everything versus if you were to outsource it to another company? Oh, you know, I just completed a, a 14 unit here in the Puget Sound, um, and it took me legitimately three times longer because I was having a third party everything. I mean, that should, that's a, I mean, all I did was doing was adding another unit to the building. And it 
uh, I just had to, I, the, I can't, I'm not hardwired to be a contractor because I can't stand relying on other people. And I, it just took forever because I couldn't get people to show up when they were supposed to show up. They would say, yeah, I'll be there tomorrow. And they would show up a week later. Um, mm -hmm. So the fact that all of the contracting is in-house and on, is on salary, I mean, we just point and shoot. You know, it's like, here's where you're going to be working today. Get out there and be there by 8 a.m. I mean, it's it it it's a lot more efficient, um, and you are talking to a couple of engineers here, basically, who crave efficiency in life. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's just the way we think about the business is just the maximizing the efficiency. If you can maximize efficiency, you're creating profit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, by doing it in house, you you just you just put everything in overdrive because you can you can be very nimble. You can shift on a dime. Um, if you're discovering there's yeah. work that you're doing, let's say your business plan called for you to renovate, you know, 30% of the units with the luxury, another 30% with the mid grade, something like that. Um, if you're discovering that you're getting way more rent premium doing your luxuries than you are on your mid grades, then you can shift on a dive and say, okay, you know what, I need to order this much more material to, for this luxury upgrade and just shift all my crews doing luxury upgrades versus the mid grade versus when you're stuck with a, construction company you're, you're locked in usually to, to some batch of units or contract where they're going to deliver x for you at some price and there's always change orders involved all right, all right. Uh, and to shift midstream of a project of magnitude that we're doing with a construction company they're going to charge you all sorts of fees and contract changes yeah. and change orders yeah. it'll nickel and dime you to death versus i can snap my fingers tomorrow and say hey this next batch of 50 units i need you to do this upgrade instead and, and everybody just does it. So it's it's much quicker, it's a lot cheaper, much more efficient. Yeah, yeah. There's, they call them contractors for a reason. Mm -hmm. It's they can do whatever they damn well please, whenever they damn well please. And it, it's just too frustrating in this business where we have, we are literally, look, money never sleeps. You gotta be moving at the speed of money. And so for us, mm -hmm. again, it's all about efficiency, being able to make those decisions on a, and turn on a dime, basically. Um, the only way we can do that is with our in-house uh, contracting help. Yeah. Exactly. And I would imagine too, especially during, you know, a time like this where we have a global pandemic going on, you know, and the, we have labor shortages and, you know, with construction costs going up and everything that with having everything in-house, you're not having to compete with um, all these other yeah. contractors. And then, you know, everybody's trying to get their businesses and we'll have all these labor shortages and everything like that. Um, so it seems like yeah. it would definitely be a much more efficient way to kind of yeah, I mean, have everything there. We have a really good kind of war story about that. Josh, why don't you talk about the freeze that happened in Texas and your response? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that I'll, I'll, I'll go a quick diatribe here. So yeah, you know, with this past February, um, you know, Texas saw an unprecedented weather storm that, you know, put, um, you know, temperatures here in Houston, at least down to single digits, some, some, you know, way below that. So we had, you know, snow on the road for the first time I've ever, since I can ever remember being in Houston and people that have lived their whole lives have never seen snow on the road or on the ground before. Obviously that caused a lot of problems because down, down South, they don't, they don't make buildings with a lot of insulation for, you know, winter storms. It is, you don't need to, right? Well, this is a freak of nature type of thing. And so we had a lot of damage to some pipes that burst in several of our, our units. And, um, you know, obviously we filed insurance claim. We got insurance money. That's all fine and dandy. But the key to getting those units back online as quickly as we did was the fact that, again, like I said earlier, I, I was able to reallocate resources and say, hey, we need to get these units back up. I didn't have to sit there and shop around and get plumbers and what have you to come out and put me on a schedule that were, by the way, are also backed up because there's a thousand other complexes in Houston that had the same problem. I I was literally at the front of my own line and got that work done ASAP and we got the units back online within a month and a half. That would have probably taken me six months using somebody else. Wow. And so then you're also able to, you know, fix it up for the, for the residents who are also there, who are looking to get that comfort, especially during that winter time frame. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 And so, you know, as you're talking to, um, as you're building up your vertically integrated company, you know, what has been the biggest challenge on, on, on setting that all up? Um, I think the biggest challenge really is developing the right process. Cause there's probably a thousand different processes that we have, you know, from all the way from, you know, invoicing properly to, uh, you know, hiring the right people, background checks, the, the whole nine yards. 
I think it was developing the process and then throwing out the ones that didn't work and continuing to throw stuff at the wall and wait to see what sticks. Because uh, everybody does things different in this business and it's with any business. You got to try a bunch of things to figure out what works and then refine it. So I think, you know, in the early stages, just getting those processes down, identifying what doesn't work and quickly and stop doing that thing and do the, and do the thing that is working and make it better. That is, that was the hardest thing. That was definitely the hardest thing. And like Mark said earlier, we're, it's never done. We're always refining. It's always a way to make it better and get rid of things that don't work. So what has been, oh, sorry, Mark, did you want to say something? Well, yeah, you know, I have a little bit of different take on it. Um, I think that um, for me, when I first got in the business, I was just focused on, oh, you know, doing the construction and getting, you know, paid at the end of the deal and creating, you know, returns that I thought were profitable. And it, my understanding of the business has completely morphed over the years mm -hmm. to a point where I only see it mainly as uh, through the lens of my investors. Um, you know, we just, we have hundreds, if not over a thousand investors in our deals now. And, you know, investor relations is just a, a ginormous component of what we do. And so, again, you know, communication, you know, we've had, and going to what Josh was saying, set up a process for effective communication that um, is 24-7, um, has been really critical to investor management. And even then, you know, it's, it's an ongoing endeavor. Um, I, I, I work on more the investor side of things now than you'd think a guy with my skill sets would be out in the field building buildings. I'm, I'm almost exclusively working on investor relations. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a, it's, it was a real eye opener for me. So, yeah, it's a good point. It's fuel of the engine. I mean, that's what drives yeah. us being able to do deals and scale. If we can't get investors that want to invest in our projects, we don't have a deal, right? We can't, we can't do anything. So that is, that is the fuel of the engine for sure. Yeah, I mean, and look, you're only as good in this business as your last deal. And if you you blow one deal, and you know you you blow it with that investor pool, I mean, it just word gets out real quick. So you have to be very, very cognizant of uh, and and sensitive to your investors, you know, needs and and whatever it is they, they want to talk about. You got to get on the phone and hammer it out with them. So, um, yeah. Good problem so, to have. Yes. And so then how have you been able to build up your investor base and how have you been able to effectively communicate to your current investors? One deal at a time, you know, really. Yeah. Um, that is, uh, that's a, that's a, um, building up your investor database is really about your reputation and, um, and then uh, just, having lots of uh, phone calls and Zoom meetings and introducing yourself to potential investors. And I've had people just email me out of the blue and want to invest with me. And, you know, it's a kind of a mousetrap I've been trying to figure out for a few years now. Um, there's, I, you know, uh, if, if anybody out there knows how to do it uh, effectively, let me know because it's an ongoing uh, uh, a thorny problem that I grapple with almost every day. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I would say success definitely breeds success in this business. Yeah. Uh, you're only as good as your last deal and the more good deals, successful deals you line up in a row, the more that word, word will spread and your track yeah. record will follow you. Um, so it's kind of like a snowball. Yeah. It's, it's hard yeah. in the beginning because you haven't established yourself, but then word will spread, especially if you do what you say you're going to do. Right. Um, and you don't miss the, the mark on the returns. Um, the investors will find you at some point, but it's never, it's not just a flip the light switch and hey, there's 10,000 investors for you. It's always that you have to keep working it. You have to keep, like Mark said, there's always a mouse trap to develop to find new investors. <laughs> it never ends. Yeah, it never ends. Um, you also have uh, to follow SEC protocol. Um, and, you know, I think both Josh and I grapple with that almost on a daily basis. So, mm -hmm. and so what is next for you and your company? I mean, for us, it's just really just to continue to scale, build out our organization. Um, you know, the more <clears throat> units you have, the more volume you have. There, there's just a lot more you can do. You can flex your muscles a lot more. Um, and so for us, it's just continue to build the, build the company, build the portfolio, um, you know, build out our corporate staff. You know, we have asset managers, accountants, um, 
acquisition people, right? The whole nine, but we need more, right? If I want to scale more, I need, I need more of those people. And it's kind of a cat and mouse problem, uh, ch sorry, chicken and egg problem. Yeah. Um, so the more units we have, the more we can hire those people and continue to expand faster. And how about for yourself, Mark? Well, for me, I have been uh, trying to um, pivot out of architecture. I still practice architecture, believe it or not. Um, but I more and more just want to focus on this business and, um, you know, kind of my second act, if you will. So I have, uh, you know, probably another 12 months as a practicing architect, and I'm hoping I'm out of it full time uh, uh, and then doing this full time. So um, that's a. Uh, that if anybody out there has ever tried to pivot from one career to the other, it's a difficult problem. Um, mm -hmm. it, it takes a lot of planning and a lot of thought. Um, I have a monthly cash flow nut that I have to kind of a meet. And, uh, you know, if you think you're just going to, you know, go buy a building and renovate it and raise rents and Next thing you know, you're on the beach in Hawaii drinking one of those little umbrella drinks. It doesn't <laughs> happen that way. It just doesn't, you know? I mean, it takes a well to build up uh, enough deals under your belt to be able to kind of get the cash flow there to live off of it. Um, you know, that one of the things that people don't realize in the, our business is we don't get paid until the end of the deal, basically. Mm -hmm. So and what we're trying to do is align our interests with our investors interest. So there's no conflict of interest. So um, yeah, to pivot off of one career into another, think I'm gonna get all this income off the second career. It's not happening, you know, and it just doesn't happen that way. So, so that's my, my biggest challenge. Josh and I have had some conversations about that, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, we're both running our own private equity firms right now and just aligning our interests. But uh, you know, for me, it's uh, making sure I can, uh, I have the income there to be able to kind of move forward with this. Yeah. Now, oh, sorry, I, I, just... to, I was added to that. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm sure your listeners come from all different walks of life, but I'll, you know, look, there's some people that don't want to be operators. They don't want to be sponsors and run these deals like how Mark and I do. And that's fine. I mean, people will realize what their path is and maybe they yeah. got a great career and they want to stick with it, but they, they, they want to also build up a, some net worth for themselves. And, you know, investing passively in deals like what we do is also a great option. It doesn't, you don't have, not everybody can be, you know, the captain of the, of the football team, right? You got to have players. And, and sometimes investors just want to be the player. They want to be the, the running back or the wide receiver, right? You never, not everybody can be the quarterback and that's fine. And so just, I, I do want your audience to know that whatever they decide to do, whatever knowledge or podcast you're listening to, there's no wrong path to take, just do something, right? Right. right. Yeah. Yep. There's plenty of roles to fill. It's just which one do you want to fill? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, frankly, there's a lot of trial and error until you figure it out. Um, so actually, I want to ask Mark really quick, going back to, you know, you talked about you want, you're going to be pivoting from full-time architect into real estate now. Um, just from a timing perspective, just so we kind of kind of understand from that moment when you were thinking about doing that transition to like the 12 months down the road where you're actually going to make that full-time transition, what, how long do you think that that took for you? Well, I got my, uh, the equivalent of a master's degree in commercial real estate development in 2001. And I didn't really get going in this business until about 2014. Um, I think that's when I started seriously looking for my first investment. 2015, found one, found one about, you know, six months later, another one. Um, third one came about 18 months after that, I'm just furiously looking for more and more deals. Um, you know, it, it, it takes a while. I mean, what I usually tell people is your first couple of years in this business, there is a just almost vertical learning curve. It, it, there is a lot to understand. I'm a licensed building professional with an advanced degree in commercial real estate development. And it still took me a ton of time to sort of get into it. Now, a lot of that was life getting in my way. You know, we had, you know, I had a couple of life events. We had the uh, economic meltdown in 2008 and nine. So it's, you know, um, you know, you can factor all of that in 
but once I really started focusing, I didn't think I, you know, I think I legitimately focused in 2014. And I'd say I am in just the last few years after I've kind of kind of hitched my wagon with Josh, that I really feel like I have uh, hit my stride. So mm -hmm. it's it takes a while, you know, and there's not a day that goes by in this business that I don't learn something. So it's mm -hmm. just a matter of accumulating knowledge and skill sets. And it takes a minute. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so how has real estate in investing impacted your life? Um, Josh, if you'd like to respond first and then Mark afterwards. Sure. Sure. I, it's completely changed my perspective on just uh, business, this country, yeah. um, what really, what really is generating wealth. I mean, there's a reason why the founding fathers of this country gave a lot, gave landowners a lot of rights and the tax code favors landowners because it's, it's, it's like being the king of the kingdom. I mean, who, he, who, he who controls the land controls basically their own destiny and the destiny of many other people. So I'm not saying that as a power, as, as a position as like a power trip or anything, but I'm just saying it as kind of a realization that this is a, one of the most powerful and most influential businesses you could ever be a part of. I mean, we're actively changing, you know, people's lives every day. I mean, we're giving people a, a amazing living environment conditions that they never would have imagined they could live in and bettering their lives for it and giving them a better quality of life. And so for that, that's kind of the, that's the heart part of it for me. Like that's, I'm, I'm making a palpable change and you can see it in our community and you can yeah. see it change before your eyes. And so that's what gets me going. Yeah. Yeah. I can say the same thing, Eileen. I went to architecture school 40 years ago. You well, you know, you have to write an essay when you go to architecture school. And I wrote my essay about affordable housing. And so I just feel like it took me 40 years to really become what I always wanted to do and uh, you know I finally figured it out when I grew up and and so um, to answer your question directly I just feel like I finally found my true calling in life and I, I knew I always wanted to be the guy I wanted to be the quarterback as Josh mm -hmm. to use Josh's, Josh's sports analogy um, mm -hmm. Not everybody wants to go through the brain damage that we go through. And we go through a lot of mm -hmm. migraines in this business. And don't kid yourself. It is a lot of work. And I mean, I'll give you a war story. I was last week going to call for a final on a building I was rehabbing. I had gotten my fire final on a Friday morning. Saturday morning at 1.30 in the morning, the place went up in flames. Wow. It's a complete loss. And I thought I was done with this project and I'm going to spend another two years working on it as we rebuild it. I mean, it's those kinds of things just can come at you out of, you know, nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had plenty of them. So, you know, if you don't like that kind of damage uh, to your psyche, um, don't do what we do. <laughs> but, uh, you know, for me, I, I sort of thrive in that environment. I don't know what it is about me or what it is about my character, but I just like, you know, I just dig in deeper and I just keep pushing. So um, maybe my Detroit upbringing or something, but, uh, you know. Um, probably, yeah, Mark, probably. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I would know. <laughs> And what is one thing that you know now about real estate that you wish you knew when you first started? Oh, everything. <laughs> really. Um, what did Einstein say? The greatest invention of uh, mankind is, uh, you know, compound interest. So um, I wish I had just started when I was a lot younger. I'd be a lot wealthier than I am now. But, you know, this business does demand a certain, you, you know, you really got to have some skin on your bones to be able to be effective and successful at this line of work. And so mm -hmm. that just comes with time and age and wisdom and, you know, yeah. you make enough mistakes and you put that behind you and get on with life. And so, yeah, yeah that for me is the, the one thing. I think for me, the realization was just how many different specialties you have to figure out at one time, kind of going off of what Mark said, you have to learn how to, effectively uh, raise capital. You have to learn how to find a deal. You have to learn how to manage the deal. You have to learn how to shop for different debt terms. You have to figure out how to find a good law firm versus a bad law firm. Um, 
dealing with the people in your operations if you're vertically integrated like we are. Just the amount, the, the things you have to get really, really good at very, very quickly is what is the, the biggest learning curve I had. I thought it was just about, you know, like Mark said earlier, <laughs> buying, buying a complex, renovating it, selling it five years later, and that was it. It's it's a lot more than that, and yeah. it's not just a nine to five Monday through Friday. It's it's an everyday thing. Yeah, twenty four seven. So, what is the one thing that sets the successful people apart in real estate? Grit. You know, tenacity. You got to be tenacious. Um, and kind of what Josh was saying is you got to be able to master a lot of different skill sets. I mean, he didn't even talk about a couple I'll throw in. You got to be able to run underwrite a deal. Yeah, that's that, that, that is an art and a science. Um, and you know, you that it is very nuanced. It takes you, you, it, it, you have to be a master at Excel and you got to like math. This, this business is nothing but a big math problem. And um, if you don't, if you're not wired to do that, then, you know, I, I, I don't know how successful you'll be. Um, I see a lot of people just go with their gut and, you know, next thing you know, they, you know, they're getting like a 1% return. It's like, well, what did you expect? You know, so um, the other thing that, uh, you know, you got to be good at is sizing up people sitting across the table from you. You know, we've JV'd on a couple of deals with some folks, a um, couple of different partnerships and, you know, they frankly didn't turn out that well. And so um, we're older and wiser now about that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And how about yourself, Josh? Um, what is one thing that sets the successful people apart in real estate? Oh man, Mark stole the answer from me. I was gonna say <laughs> tenacity, seriously. Uh, I'll think of another one. Um, I think the other thing that sets them apart is not getting bogged down by the thousands of problems that can come at you at any one time. You have to be able to prioritize the things that are urgent need to be dealt with right away and, and table the things that can be worked on later for another time. And that's really the case with any business. I mean, there's no business yeah. that's not true, yeah. but it's especially true in real estate because, you know, you could have things that might seem like a, like a super urgent fire to put out now, but if it's a small problem, it can wait till tomorrow because there's something more urgent, then you need to prioritize that. Yeah. Um, so people that are effective at being organized and attacking the problem and the right problem at the right time are also successful. I think that definitely sets people apart. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. And so um, the last question I have for you is what tools or techniques um, have you used to improve the efficiency of your life or your business? Um, you know, from our standpoint, we're, I kind of said this earlier, we're extremely process driven and process involves some type of a method or format to invoke that process. So we have, Tons of softwares that we use for, for the property management side, to the accounting side, to the renovation and construction side. Um, so, you know, having those all tied up in, in one place and, and organizing the process, that that's 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 what it is for us. You know, Josh, you know, stole the answer from me, but uh, <laughs> um, you know, I rely a lot on technology to do what I do in the capital raising side of things. Um, and candidly, I, you know, building a brand just takes, you know, a lot of time and effort. And I hire a lot of people. I utilize a lot of gig workers. Um, I just continually discover new and new ways to kind of leverage uh, what I can find out there and, uh, you know, build a very, powerful brand. And um, so, yeah, technology is a big component of what I do. It always has been as a practicing architect. I, I'm pretty proficient in a lot of software titles, probably 40 at this point. Um, so it's just kind of, like I said, pivoting and leveraging um, all of that expertise into this new endeavor. So, awesome. well, not so new for me anymore, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's different direction. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. Well, Mark and Josh, I really appreciate the two of you coming on the show today and, and sharing everything that you've shared today with us. Um, actually, I do have one more question for the two of you. And if our listeners wanted to find out more about um, you guys and what you're doing and maybe reach out, um, where's the best place that they can go? Uh, well, for me at Three Pillars, it's um, my email is joshw at three pillars capital group and three is spelled out. So it's all one word three pillars, capital group.com. 
Um, email is always the best way. Happy to talk with anybody that might be interested in our projects or learning more about what we do. Yeah, for me, it's uh, Mark at S G R E Investments. That's plural. dot com. S G R E for Schuler Group Real Equity. And uh, yeah, likewise for me, email is always the best way to um, get in touch with me. I'm usually right in front of this box, so um, I. <laughs> Um, respond usually in a couple of minutes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, you two, for coming on again. I really appreciate everything. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for having us.